Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, my name is Yosef Arbiv, and this is Steve Bolmer. He is the previous CEO, uh, former CEO of Microsoft. Uh, he's a great guy, and I'm sure that he, live, he likes you because you're all developers, <laughs> and he really likes developers. But what he didn't like uh, 20 years ago was open source. Um, 20 years ago, uh, he called open source uh, communism uh, and also uh, cancer. Um, but now, 20 years later, uh, Microsoft acquired GitHub, and you can run Linux from your Windows machines uh, with the WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. So Windows has a complete different approach to open source than it had 20 years ago. Today, I'm not going to talk about Microsoft or Linux. I'm going to talk about our journey with open source, about our journey with open telemetry. When we started Epsagon, uh, it was five years ago, we started with closed source libraries and proprietary protocols. Today, we are a part of the open telemetry community. We are building products that support open telemetry natively, and we are a part of Cisco. So I'm going to talk about how we got from where we started to where we are today, on the mistakes that we made along the way, and what you can learn from them if you want to combine open source in your products. So we are going to do an introduction on observability in general. Then we are going to talk about different steps, uh, the different stages in our journey with open telemetry. Uh, we are going to talk about our plans for the future, and we will have some time for questions at the end of this talk. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Yosef Arbiv. Uh, I'm the father of three adorable young boys, and I'm the group manager at Cisco ETNI for Open Telemetry. So, my group is responsible for contributing code to open telemetry, and I have 12 years of experience as a software engineer and as a team leader. So let's start by talking on observability in general. What is observability? So this is the Wikipedia definition of observability. Uh, observability is a measure of how well the internal state of the system can be inferred from the external outputs of your system. So if you have a system, it can be in one of many different uh, 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 states. If you can know in which state your system currently is by looking on the external outputs of the system, you can say that your system is observable. Uh, but let's try to understand what exactly does it mean in the context of software development and software maintenance. So let's say we have a simple application. Uh, our logic is running on a single host, and uh, we have uh, an API gateway, and we have a database. Uh, we, we want to know if the system is working as it should be, right? We want to know if everything is running, or we have some issue. Maybe we have an issue with the database, and so on. So what we want to do is to collect some metrics from this application, right? So we can know if everything is running uh, as it should be. Um, <clears throat> and then we can set up some alerts, maybe, if there are latency issues, for example, and so on. Um, but this is not enough. When we have an issue, we want to be able to look at the logs from our system. So we would run another agent on this system that collects log f logs from the different modules in our system, and it sends the logs to a aggregator, hopefully, outside of the application, so we can look on the logs and see the current status of our system. But what happens as we move to microservices architecture? Nowadays, more and more companies are moving from a monolith architecture to microservices architecture. And this is, happen this is happening for a couple of reasons. First, microservices are easier to scale. If you want to be able to scale your application to support more and more customers, it is much easier 
if you are using a microservices architecture. The second reason is that microservices can reduce the blast radius of bugs. So if you have a bug in one of the microservices, it only affects the specific flows in the system that this microservice is involved in. Other flows in the system are not affected by this bug. Microservices can also support smaller size of teams. So you can have teams that are responsible for a subset of the microservices, and you can have smaller teams in your organization. So there are great reasons to use microservices, but it also presents some challenges to the development team. So this is how a small uh, demo application that we wrote at Epsagon, how it looks like on a microservices architecture. As you can see, there are different, many different microservices that are talking to each other, and it can be difficult to track uh, what exactly is happening inside our system. This is how an actual application <laughs> looks like, not a demo one. So you can see that it is much harder to understand what exactly is happening in our system. So what are the challenges that we are facing here? We have three main challenges uh, when we are talking about maintaining uh, those applications. The first challenge is modeling your system. Only understanding those pictures that I showed earlier is not that obvious, right? To get to know what are the different microservices, who is talking to each other, what flows do I have in my system, which microservice participate in each flow, it can be very hard. If we will go back to the definition of observability, I said that the definition is to know in which state the system currently is, right? So only understanding what are the different states that our consistent being is very hard when we have a system that is built on microservices architecture. The second uh, challenge is troubleshooting our application. Let's say that we have an alert that we have an issue with one of our uh, flows in the system. It can take a lot of time to understand which flow exactly is it in our system. And then we have to look into the different microservices that participate in this flow. We have to search for in, in the logs of each one of the microservices. Uh, maybe we need to correlate between different logs from different microservices to understand what exactly is the flow, this flow, what is the root cause all of this bug, and only then, only after we search and we find the exact microservice that is responsible for this behavior, only then we can start investigate for the root cause and hopefully fix this issue in our system. The last challenge that I want to talk about is optimizing our system. Let's say we have a customer that complains that a certain flow in the system uh, is not as fast as it should be. Again, we need to search for the different microservices that participate in this flow. We need to find the specific microservice that, that is responsible for this behavior, and only then we can uh, uh, start fixing this issue and maybe optimize our system. So in order to deal with those challenges, we have the three pillars of observability. We have metrics, logs, and traces. Those uh, pillars help us with these challenges that I explained before. The first pillar is metrics. Metrics tells us what is happening inside our system. So metrics are essentially uh, numbers on a timeline. Um, we can collect business metrics. Uh, how many transactions do we have in our system? Um, are there... Uh, checkout transactions or return transactions, if we're talking about um, a, 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 a shop, right? What, what is important when we are talking about microservices architecture is to be able to collect the different metrics from all of the different microservices in our uh, system into a single dashboard. So we can have one place to look at all of the different metrics from all of our system. The second pillar uh, are logs. Logs are the most basic kind of uh, telemetry data that we get from applications, right? Uh, every system produces logs. 
Um, but when we are talking about uh, distributed systems, it is important uh, to, uh, that there are some things that we should uh, take care of regarding our logs. The first thing is that we would like our logs to be structured. We want the logs to be uh, in a certain uh, format and not just random string that each developer uh, decide on their own uh, what exactly should they write. When we have structured logs, it's easier to store them and it is easier to search in them later. Another thing that is important is to add identifiers into our logs. When we are adding identifiers into our logs, such as user ID, uh, transaction ID, customer ID, and so on, it is easier to correlate the logs between different microservices in our system uh, so we can connect the different logs that participate in one flow. So we can uh, then search for all of the logs from all of the different microservices that are uh, inside this single flow. And the last pillar are traces. And when we are talking about distributed system, we are talking about distributed traces. So let's explain what exactly are distributed traces. So this is an example for a distributed trace on a timeline uh, representation. So a distributed trace tells us the story of a transaction or an event in our system as it propagates through the entire distributed system. So here we have uh, operation A, uh, which triggered this entire trace. Each tile here is called a span. A span is a rep representation of a single unit of work. All of these spans together are a distributed trace. So we have operation A, then the operation A triggered operation B, uh, which in turn triggered C and D, and when operation D completed, the entire B operation completed, and then operation E was triggered, and then the entire A operation was completed, okay? So we can understand the different microservices that were uh, a part of this of flow, of this uh, operation, uh, and we can see them on a timeline. This is another representation uh, uh, of a distributed trace, but this time as a graph representation. So you can see the different microservices that participated in this flow. Um, you can see that we had a checkout operation, and in order to complete this operation, we, we uh, had to uh, go to the Mongo database and uh, uh, Redis cache. And then you can see that we had an error when we tried to access the uh, discount service. Okay? So here you can see how a distributed trace can help us understand where exactly an error happened inside our system. And you can see how uh, from this uh, checkout operation that failed, we can then continue to search into the logs of the discount service and see what exactly was the root cause of this, uh, of this error in our system. Okay, so now we understand better uh, what exactly are distributed traces and what is observability, and we can talk about uh, our journey, the epsilon journey with open telemetry. So uh, the, the first uh, act is uh, what happened before OpenTelemetry existed. Um, when we started Epsilon, we targeted the serverless market. Uh, serverless is a concept where you are using microservices, but you are not managing them on your own, uh, but you are using the cloud provider. The cloud provider provi uh, provides those microservices, and it manages them for you. So you don't need to care about uh, which server uh, is, is running those services. Um, it, you're not dealing with um, Kubernetes clusters or anything like that. Um, essentially, you have small pieces of, uh, of, of Lego. With, you can build whatever you want with those pieces. So you have small pieces of services that are provided by this cloud provider, and you can build your application uh, on top of it. So we saw that those customers uh, using serverless architecture have many issues with troubleshooting their applications. So we decided to uh, try to create a product that will help those customers to have a better way to troubleshoot their applications. So 
initially we targeted customers using uh, AWS cloud. This was the most popular cloud, and it's one of the biggest clouds uh, until today. Uh, so we, we, were needed, we needed some way to collect those uh, spans from the application, from the customer application, in order to be able to create such graphs in our backend. So we searched uh, on how can we create those traces, how can we create those spans from the customer's uh, code, from the customer's microservices that were running on AWS cloud. And back then, there was no industry standard for distributed traces generation and distributed traces format. What did exist back then was open tracing. Open tracing was an open source uh, project for creating distributed traces. But we had a couple of issues with it. The first issue was that open tracing only supported um, manual traces. That meaning that the customer needed to write the trace on their own. And we wanted to create something that will be automatic for the customer, so that the customer does not need to have any way to, um, uh, to configure this or to, uh, to write their own code. We wanted the onboarding to be as smooth as possible for our customers. The second issue was that back then, open tracing was backed by mostly one company that was a competitor of ours. So we were a little bit afraid of putting our entire business depending on a single competitor. So eventually, we decided not to use open tracing and to build our own SDKs, to build our own libraries and our own traces format. So um, we created those libraries and we started to, uh, to gain more and more customers using those libraries uh, and troubleshooting their application using our backend. Um, at first, we want those libraries to be closed source. We thought that the way that we are uh, instrumenting the code and generating those traces automatically for our customers can be uh, one of our uh, intellectual property and one of the, things that the way that we can protect our product. But soon enough, we discovered that customers did not want to install closed source libraries into their code. Our customers wanted to know what is happening inside their systems. Uh, they were afraid that we will crash their systems. So we decided to open up our libraries and to publish them as open source. We were also hoping that um, we'll be able to create a community around those libraries so we can have contributions from customers and from outside of our organization to those libraries. So maybe customers can fix their own bugs sometimes or contribute a new instrumentation to a new framework or something like that in the future. So this is the first uh, act, the first stage of, of uh, our story. And I want to talk about the lessons we learned from this stage uh, with OpenTelemetry, with uh, distributed traces before OpenTelemetry. So the first uh, lesson is about product defensibility. When you are building a new product, it is important to understand which parts of this product you should be defensible on and which parts can be open to the public. When you are trying to protect the entire product, uh, usually you are wasting too much energy and like in our case, you can be hurting your own business. So you, you want to be able to decide which, ex which exactly parts should be uh, defensible and which can be open. The second lesson is about building an open source community. Building an open source community can take a lot of resources from a company. You need to really invest in the community and this is not something that uh, uh, is easy to do, especially when you are a small startup. In our case, uh, we opened the sources, so our sources were open, but it was not really an open source project. So there weren't really a lot of contribution from outside of the company um, because we didn't have the resources as a small startup to build a strong community around our libraries. So it is much easier to join a community rather than to build your own open source community uh, for your own uh, libraries. 
The second act is the standardization of the market. So uh, we had a good success with the serverless, uh, the serverless market. We were very popular, but we understand that the serverless market was not big enough to build our entire business uh, on, only on it. And we search for other ways we can expand our business. And we, we decided we want to expand it to customers using Kubernetes clusters. But when we examined those clusters, how exactly those libraries look like, we find out that it was much more complex than the serverless uh, case. On serverless, uh, there was a relatively small number of languages that were supported by the cloud provider, and there are limited set of frameworks that you are using on the cloud provider. Usually, you have one cloud provider, and you interact with different components that this cloud provider uh, provides. So, essentially, there are small set of, 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 uh, of features, uh, that small set of frameworks that we need to support, um, and there was a, a limited set of SDKs that we had to develop. But when we are talking about Kubernetes clusters, there are a lot of different languages. For each language, there are tons of different frameworks that can be used, and it is really hard uh, to develop all of, the, all of these different um, SDKs. And we realized that there is no chance that we were able to create all of them on our own. So we checked again what's happening with open tracing. And open tracing was much more mature uh, then. Um, open tracing was more popular. It had a lot of different companies uh, uh, supporting it. And there, there were already some distributions of open tracing that were using automatic instrumentations. So we created a fork of, the, of those distributions uh, in order to fit our own needs. Uh, so we were able to create forks of those distributions where we changed them uh, in order to match to our proprietary traces format. And we were able to add our easy onboarding uh, to those distributions. And we published them as our own uh, SDKs. Uh, and then what happened is uh, a very exciting moment for the community is the announcement of OpenTelemetry. So OpenTelemetry was announced as a merger of Open Census and Open Tracing. Open Census was another, um, another open source project that was dealing with automatic instrumentation and was focused on metrics. Um, and together with Open Tracing, uh, together with Open Tracing, uh, OpenTelemetry was uh, announced as the new version of Open Tracing and Open Census. So I want to explain a little bit on what exactly is OpenTelemetry and what you can do with OpenTelemetry. So OpenTelemetry is a collection of tools, APIs, and SDKs. So it is not just a one library, one framework. It, it is a collection of a variety of tools uh, and SDKs. And you can use it to instrument, generate, collect and export telemetry data. So OpenTelemetry deals with the generation of the, of the telemetry data, which can be metrics, logs, and traces, and how you collect it, how and how you export it. Um, and it is done to help you analyze uh, and improve your software behavior and performance. So this is a basic, um, a basic architecture of an application using OpenTelemetry. So you can see that uh, we have APIs and SDKs that can be run beside your application. Um, and you can also process the data and export the data using OpenTelemetry uh, um, libraries from your application. And then you can send it to a backend either directly from the exporter from within your application or alternatively using an OpenTelemetry collector. An open telemetry collector is a tool that you can use. Uh, it can run beside your application on the same host or on a different host uh, as a gateway. And it can receive the data from one or many different sources. It also supports sources that are external to open telemetry. Uh, it can have one or many processors that process the data. And then 
it can have exporters that export the data to a backend. Okay, so open telemetry deals with uh, the generation and collection of the telemetry data. It does not deal with the backend, with the side of uh, visualizing the data uh, or storing the data. There are different um, open source projects for that or uh, vendor specific project that supports open telemetry. So open telemetry became popular uh, relatively fast uh, because it already had big communities of open census and open tracing behind it. And we started to use open telemetry libraries as uh, the basics for our libraries. So we took open telemetry code, uh, we modified it, we added our logic to it, our logic that was collecting more data. Open telemetry usually collects metadata from the application, and we wanted to collect also actual data from the transaction so we can visualize it to our customers because we find out that this was really helpful for our customers to understand the root cause of the issues in their system. So we created uh, more and more forks of open telemetry. Uh, and this way we were able to support more and more customers as we, grow, uh, as we expanded our business uh, using open telemetry libraries. So what are the lessons we learned from this phase? The first lesson is about uh, forks. So as I mentioned, we created forks of open telemetry in order to create our libraries. And what we found out is, is that forks are really fast to create. We could create more and more uh, forks really fast. Uh, we, we knew what we should change uh, in order to, uh, to fit our needs, our uh, proprietary uh, format of traces. But forks were hard to maintain. Each time there was a new version of OpenTelemetry or a bug was fixed in OpenTelemetry, we had to cherry pick those changes into our code. Because we changed the code, we couldn't use newer versions of OpenTelemetry and maintaining those forks became a headache. Uh, and this brings me to the le uh, second lesson, which is about balancing between velocity and tech debt. As we created more and more forks, we actually created uh, a tech debt because we have more forks we need to maintain um, and the maintenance of them was uh, really hard. But on the other hand, uh, having ab been able to create those forks very fast helped us get more customers and expand our business. So this is a, um, something that you need to balance when you are uh, building your business. And this is what led us to the third act uh, when, we, when we joined Cisco and the open telemetry community. So what happened is that we realized that all of those libraries were really hard to maintain. Uh, we noticed that we are investing too much time in maintaining more and more libraries. And we realized that this was the time to make a change on how we create our uh, libraries. So we decided to create an experiment with our Java agent. We created a new version of the Java agent, of our Java uh, SDK, but this time it was not a fork, but it was a distribution of open telemetry. We used uh, open telemetry um, code, but we didn't change it. We used it as is, and we only expanded it. We only extend it using the extension mechanism of OpenTelemetry. So we took the OpenTelemetry code and we extended it to collect more data that we need from our, for our uh, customers. And we also added the uh, uh, zero code onboarding to it so our customers can just install the agent and have nothing else to do. And we also had to do some changes to our backend because our backend was supporting only our proprietary format. So we, we, we made some changes to our backend to support the open telemetry trace format. And then we were able to collect data from the open telemetry distribution um, in our system. And this experiment went well. We managed to create a distribution of open telemetry in a relatively short time without uh, too much changes to our uh, code and to our backend. And we wanted to create more and more libraries in this way by creating distributions of open telemetry 
extending open telemetry. But then we had uh, a change of plans. Uh, Epstagon was acquired by Cisco, and it, it, we decided to stop working on the previous Epstagon product and to join forces with Cisco in order to create the full stack observability platform for Cisco customers. So today, we took another step towards the community, and we decided that we want our customers to be able to use open telemetry natively, meaning that our product will support open telemetry natively and not our own uh, distributions. So we can know that our uh, product is, uh, is going together with the entire community in the same direction. So today we're working on two products as a part of Cisco. The first product is AppDynamics Cloud, uh, which supports open telemetry natively. And we are working on the distributed traces experience within AppDynamics Cloud. And the second product that we are working on uh, is an open source product for visualizing uh, distributed traces. And it also supports open telemetry natively. Um, and we hope to, uh, to publish it uh, in the next uh, month. So it will be available for the entire community uh, as complete open source project. Uh, where you can uh, self-host it on your, own, uh, on your own systems, and you can send telemetry data from open telemetry into this open source product, so you can visualize your uh, telemetry data um, and have a complete open source uh, stack. So in the future, we hope to become uh, a significant part of open telemetry. We are working on contributing our code from our distributions back to the community, back to OpenTelemetry. This is what we are doing now. We want to, the, to be able to, uh, to have what we figured out that was helpful for our customers. We want it to be available for the entire community. So we are working now on contributing those uh, changes to OpenTelemetry. And we want, as a part of Cisco, to be able to create a better observability future for the entire uh, open source community. So, Thank you very much for joining me, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. Yes. Yes. Just one second. Is your uh, second product you said, which will be published next month, yeah. is to replace Jaeger for future? Yes. So uh, uh, the purpose is to have um, something like Jaeger, but with a, a better focus on distributed traces and better visualization of open traces, of distributed traces, yes. Exactly. Thank you. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Maybe for our uh, remote audience? Okay. No? Okay. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, I will be here for a couple of minutes. And you can also uh, um, reach me out in those platforms on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I'll be available, and I'll be happy to take any other questions or uh, ideas you have. Uh, so thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.